Okay, welcome yeah. everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Today we are hosting our second workshop of um, the spring on climate justice. Today's workshop is called Indigenous Climate Resiliencies in Latin America, Teaching Climate Justice and Local Activism Through Documentary Film, um, including lesson plans by Whitney Wagner and Emily Tither and resource guides um, by Jasmine Moore. So goals workshop is to provide a space where educators can connect and we can mutually brainstorm on how to implement um, the lesson plans presented here in our classroom. So with that being said, it would be wonderful if everyone could turn their cameras on if you are willing and able so we can see your faces and hopefully spark a little more engagement. Um, we want to get to know you and get to know each other. So um, if everyone could introduce yourselves, um, tell us your name, where you teach, what you teach, um, and what drew you to this workshop. So we'll just go around kind of popcorn style. So I'll start and then I'll pick someone else and then that person can pick someone and um, we will get to know each other. So my name is Jasmine and I am a graduate assistant with the LAII, the Latin American and Iberian Institute, um, their K through 12 outreach um, uh, program. And I, I do not teach, I have taught abroad and in Seattle, I've taught English. Um, and then I've worked with incarcerated individuals on different educational um, goals that they have. So helping them um, work through um, those things. And what drew me to the workshop, I have to be here, you guys, but I'm really excited to meet all of you. Um, so I will pick Ian. Hi, um, my name is Ian Malone. I'm, I'm not an educator. I'm actually currently a student at UNM myself. I am a undergraduate in the Earth and Planetary Science um, program, and I'm currently taking a sustainabilities course. Um, I was drawn to this uh, just through interest and, um, you know, reach out hour requirements. Um, I don't know what else to say about it other than um, it seemed very interesting and um, worked out. Thanks, Ian. Nice to meet you. We're glad to have you. Um, will you pick someone else to go? How about um, David? Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, David Sussbrig. I uh, teach public speaking at University of New Mexico, or sorry, University of Montana, <laughs> and um, or Montana State University, as well as I teach uh, Spanish at the Belgrade High School here in Montana. And uh, what drew me to the program is. Um, I've had the great opportunity to uh, live and work in a, a handful of different uh, indigenous nations throughout Latin America. And um, yeah, I'm just looking for more uh, curriculum along the way that I can share in a variety of different teaching styles. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yes. And then I'll select someone. Um, uh, Lasha, Lasha, forgive me if I'm saying that incorrectly. Yeah, sorry, you said you said it correctly. <laughs> um, I, hi, uh, I'm not currently a teacher. I'm just an undergraduate, and I found this workshop and found it interesting. So, um, thought I could learn some stuff. Uh, I am uh, a major in uh, interdisciplinary arts, and um, yeah. <laughs>
Thanks, Lasha. We're glad you're here. Do you want to pick someone to share next? Yeah. Um, I hope uh, he did say my name. I don't know if he said somebody else's name or not, but uh, um, I'm all flustered. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll choose um, uh, Nancy. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, that's probably me. I can't see all the names, but uh, there's no one in the United States under 50 named Nancy, so it must be me. I'm Nancy Singham. Um, <laughs> it's a name that's gone out of favor. My name is Nancy Singham. I graduated uh, from, uh, got my master's degree in early childhood education in the 70s at UNM, have been a kindergarten teacher, and now uh, fast forward uh, 35 years and um, move back to New Mexico and work with the Climate Change Group 350 New Mexico. Uh, I'll pick Juliana. Hi. Um... Juliana, are you there? We can't hear you. Hello? I can hear you now. Oh, okay. Um, hi, I'm Juliana. Uh, I, I don't teach either. I'm actually a UNM student. Um, I'm an undergraduate in uh, film and digital arts. Um, I'm also taking a sustainability course fulfilling mm -hmm. some uh, community engagement hours. Um, yeah. Cool. Great. Nice to meet you, Juliana. Do you want to pick someone to go next? Um, I'll pick Rachel. Hi, can y'all hear me? Yes. Awesome. Yes. So uh, I'm about to, thanks for picking me, Juliana, because I'm about to drive home and I was like waiting. Um, I teach at Garfield Middle School, which is right there. And I teach eighth grade social studies and seventh and eighth grade English language development. And um, this workshop interested me because I've been thinking about how I can include more indigenous voices in my ELD classroom. Um, and we just finished reading The House on Mango Street. And so I was like, okay, for our last quarter, you know, how could I bring in kind of some different perspectives? So I'm excited. Thank you. Oh, and I will call on um, Steffi. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'll pick Steffi. I uh, was a K-12 educator at UNM um, through the School of Engineering. Um, and I have done outreach at Garfield and worked with some of the science teachers there, um, by the way. And then I quit UNM um, because I was working on a grant that was all about oil and gas and nobody ever wanted me to talk about climate change. So I thought that was really irresponsible. Um, so I am now working with Nancy. Uh, at 350 New Mexico and doing climate advocacy full-time. And I will pick Valerie. Thanks, I'm Valerie Rangel and I'm not a, currently an educator, but I taught college classes in environmental science in Santa Fe and the sustainability classes probably has read my book, Environmental Justice Counting Coup in New Mexico. So I hope you have enjoyed that and I'm here because I just want to know how the power of documentary film is being used by local activists and just uh, to get the Latin American indigenous perspective as well and I'll, I will call upon Adrian if you haven't gone. Hi everyone uh, my name is Adrian Navila. I am a uh, middle school teacher I teach at Truman Middle School out here on the west side I'm a, a gifted math teacher, so a different voice, I guess. But during my algebra classes, I always incorporate uh, global components in. 
Um, so I teach, for example, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, one of which happens to be, you know, climate resiliency. And I just want to see how I can further enhance those lessons that I already give. Uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing all about this program. And I believe Mike hasn't gone yet. Yes, hello. Uh, it's Michael. <laughs> um, I'm I'm not a teacher. I am a undergrad student going to um, um, UNM, and I am studying um, my associate's degree in environmental planning and design, which is kind of like a landscape or how we design buildings to flow with the land, you could say, without um, interfering with the environment too much. So I think, and I think sustainability is something that something needs to be talked about more. And I'm currently in a sustainability studies class. So I'm here to um, fulfill some hours and get to know some people. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, I think if you want to pick someone else to go, I, I don't think that Margaret has shared. Um, I'm trying to look at my list here. Um, or Whitney. Okay, uh, Margaret. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, uh -huh. you can hear me? Okay, great. Yep, we can hear um, you. I'm not sure why my yeah, I'm not sure why my video is not working, but that may be <laughs> to your advantage, not mine. Uh, I uh, am a physician. Uh, I have taught though through my long life, through everywhere from grade school through medical school. Um, I am uh, interested in this workshop because one I'm very interested in climate and how to educate people about how to solve the problems we're facing. And the other thing what is that I have worked uh, with indigenous folks, both in Latin America and Africa. And so I was interested about the specifically how uh, problems of the, with the climate were impinging upon them. And I'll choose Whitney. Hi, my name is Whitney and I am the other graduate assistant for the LAII. Um, so that's what drew me to this workshop today. And I don't teach currently, but I have taught English abroad in the past. Thanks, Whitney and everyone for introducing themselves. We have a great group today. Um, I have 14 on my list and I only counted 13 that introduced themselves. So did anybody not? In okay, okay. Uh, Isela, I hope I said that right. In the chat, she said, hello, I am Isela Rendon. I teach at Trace Volcanes. Pardon? Um, I lead an after school program at my school and found this workshop helpful to my students. Um, okay, so did I miss anyone? All right, we're gonna move on. So today's workshop will be focused on global climate activism through the lens of indigenous resiliencies, and then we're gonna bring it back um, to local activism and issues. We will first have a presentation by Nancy and Steffi from 350 New Mexico, who um, we briefly met during our introductions. Their presentation addresses the need to support local teachers in climate education and recognizing the importance of youth voices on this issue. They're developing a climate change curriculum to help educate and activate middle school students. In this workshop, Nancy and Steffi will introduce the outline of their four day middle school climate hope from knowledge to action pilot unit and point to a few other ways your students can engage in climate action. Following their presentation, Whitney will quickly go over the um, La Vocera documentary 
highlighting indigenous resiliencies and collective action in Mexico, and then dive more in depth to our making a documentary lesson plan, um, where students have the opportunity to consider local climate issues and think of creative ways to present them and find solutions. And then we'll have some closing discussion um, and time for question and comments. So a little bit about the LAII before um, we hear from 350 New Mexico. Um, the Latin American and Iberian Institute is committed to expanding awareness, knowledge, and understanding of Latin America and Iberia among diverse constituents. Whitney and I are both graduate assistants for the LAII's K through 12 um, outreach. Um, and the our uh, the K through 12 outreach program um, facilitates professional development workshops like the one um, we are all in right now. We have book groups and a blog called Vamos a la Air, which I really um, encourage you to check out. There's weekly book reviews on there and then different kind of like um, lesson plans and um, curriculum. And then um, we have local lending resources and youth events. So I'm just going to briefly introduce um, 350 New Mexico, um, because I'm sure that Stephanie and Nancy will elaborate further. Um, <clears throat> Nancy and Steffi are members of the 350 New Mexico Steering Committee. 350.org was founded in 2008 as an international grassroots activist movement to push governments and institutions to prevent climate change while supporting climate justice. So um, I will let you all take it over and share your presentation with us. Great, thank you, Jasmine. <clears throat> thank you. So um, I assume you can all see that. Great, thanks. So Nancy and I are very happy to be here. Um, obviously we are not indigenous and this is something that a lot of people like us struggle with. Um, so we're not representing indigenous groups. We, we, we do try to work with as many people from different communities that we can. Um, but we're not in any way, you know, representing them. They speak for themselves, just so you know that. Um, so if you're wondering what the 350 stands for in 350 New Mexico, it's the 350 parts per million of uh, CO2, which is, you probably know is a greenhouse gas. And, uh, you know, this shows 350 is thought to be a safe level. Um, we're uh, way above that now. And the way we're going is going to be a lot more than that. And then we'll be in for a lot of trouble. Um, and what that means for New Mexico has been uh, put into a report that just came out last year um, by a, a number of New Mexico scientists. And they concluded that New Mexico by 2070 is going to warm by five to seven degrees Fahrenheit. And they call this a staggering temperature increase. Um, and it will is bringing a, about what is called aridification. This is not a drought in our usual sense. Uh, droughts in the past have come with uh, less precipitation. This is completely different. They expect the amount of precipitation to be about the same. What is different is the temperature is going up because of methane and carbon dioxide. And that temperature increase is going to change everything. It means that there will not be enough water available for all living things in New Mexico. And it's already starting to look very different. Um, the scientists are seeing the return of the Dust Bowl conditions in the eastern part of New Mexico. Um, in the Navajo Nation in Arizona, 
the plants that normally keep back sand dunes from migrating have died. So we're seeing sand dunes come and encompass roads and houses and infrastructure. And they're expecting that this will start happening in New Mexico too in the Northwest part of the state. And in our forests in the Northern part of New Mexico, um, the aridification is killing trees through um, the stresses of the temperature and lack of water, but also of course from pests um, and fires. And then following that, there is um, huge debris flows when the rains come. The water becomes what's called hydrophobic. It can't absorb water anymore. Um, and then uh, we're basically talking about the end of trees in New Mexico. And there'll be uh, also the end of soils in certain south facing slopes. And it takes thousands of years for soils to form. So we don't want this to happen, obviously. So at 350, we are working very hard uh, towards a number of solutions to this. Um, this is a list of ones that we'll talk about today. But before we get to that, just want to point out, as Jasmine said in her introduction, while we each individually do what we can, we try not to fly um, as much as possible. Some of us have electric cars and solar cells, but individual actions are not enough. Climate change has to be addressed by governments and institutions and companies. So that's what we push for. Um, also, I know there aren't that many teachers here, but um, teachers and students can make a difference. They can do the same things we're doing in the larger world. They can, you can do um, push for these changes in your, where you work, where you live, who you talk to um, in, in your life. And also um, the climate crisis needs people of every interest and every skill. Uh, it's not just a science class because the world is not just about science. So uh, what, one of our big, as I said, one of our big um, focuses is on reducing uh, greenhouse emissions and phasing out fossil fuels. And in New Mexico in particular, that's very important because we have an oil and gas industry here. It accounts for over half of all of our greenhouse gas emissions um, per capita here in New Mexico. Each of us is responsible 50 tons of greenhouse emissions a year, and that's compared to other states, which is 18. Uh, just this week, uh, or last week, there was a study that came out that showed that in the Permian, we're leaking almost 10% uh, methane. And methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. Um, so we uh, take a lot of action in this area. Uh, this shows, um, Sorry, uh, our, one of our members, um, Anne McCartney and her husband Ward, they, they've gone to try to stop pipelines um, in indigenous communities, um, the, the pipelines carry natural gas and oil. Um, we write letters to the editor. We are involved in writing legislation and then we also um, get a lot of public comment during the legislature and when rules are being formed about for relations. And uh, just this week, we, uh, we have a speaker series. So just this week, we had um, a wonderful talk about methane by this professor from, from Cornell. Um, so students can do that, um, and they do, and they can do a lot more too. Uh, there's a of young people um, called Yucca who are, oops, sorry. In the uh, in Northern California, uh, I mean, sorry, in Northern New Mexico, um, and they're an indigenous group. And here you see pictures of them talking at the governor's office, at interim committees. Uh, in the last legislature, there was a bill called HB6, which was to reduce emissions in New Mexico. And they um, objected to parts of it in the environmental they were very persuasive to the rest of the environmental community and they made it a much much stronger bill so that was really great this is another group um, called ace the action for climate emergency and they um they don't operate here in new mexico but uh they are students everywhere can join them and um 
and learn how to be activists through there. And also if anybody ever wants to make a video to talk about why climate change um, matters in New Mexico, we, we can put it on our uh, website. Uh, the next thing that we're trying to do is of course put um, get renewable clean energy. And the reason we want to do that is because uh, obviously it's better than fossil fuels, but the International Energy Agency um, and others like the Solutions Project out of Stanford, they've written roadmaps that tell us if we want to avoid the worst parts of climate change, um, this is what we have to replace fossil fuels with. And this is an example of the, the largeness of the project. Every single state, have to install um, every month for the next 16 years on average, one 200 megawatt wind farm and four 50 megawatt solar farms, just to give you an example. That's huge. And we need to be putting our resources in that instead of getting distracted by things like hydrogen and carbon storage, which is not gonna work. Um, so to promote that, we work on legislatures, We give talks, that's me standing on my roof um, uh, as part of a solar house tour. Um, we promote electric vehicles, that's Nancy at the state fair and talking to um, some rural and some rural fairs that we go to, we bring electric cars, we talk about renewable energy. Um, when I was at UNM, we have camps and it's very important for people to envision what we want the world to be like. And this is um, an amazing activist there. I love this, this video, it's three minutes. You should watch it, it'll really make your day. Um, but we also work with the Land Art Generator. These are wonderful people. They hold um, uh, contests every few years and they have professionals who use renewable energies and design these beautiful, beautiful um, uh, installations that you know, actually power homes. And so we had some um, high school students create those. These are a collection of solar futures, our science fiction stories. So there's lots of great ways to envision what we want for the future. Um, so students can do that. They can also work very hard on uh, making their schools a model for that future. Um, there's a lot of students here from UNM why don't we have electric shuttles? Why do we charge people to use the um, EV charging uh, uh, chargers on campus? Why are we still using natural gas on campus? Why do we still have styrofoam on campus? There's so many things we could be doing. So, um, but this can be done at any level, uh, of course. And finally, um, I've been very involved in the divestment movement um, and because, you know, on a moral basis, it's, it's, uh, it's just incomprehensible that, you know, students go and take classes about climate change and then at the same time, the university is supporting um, the companies that are creating an unlivable future. So at UNM, I work with UNM LEAF is the undergraduate group uh, the Climate Action Group, and we have um, filed a complaint with the New Mexico Attorney General um, saying that the investments um, are not only uh, immoral, uh, but illegal. Um, so we're still going through that. And you can sign too, anybody on this call can sign up um, to add their name to the complaint. And then we also um, have protests at Chase Bank, they're the number one worst bank for um, enabling fossil fuel companies to continue projects. So um, students are already doing this. And uh, this is, and actually I'll just say one more thing, 350 International, their, their big goals for this year are to stop two pipelines. Um, one's in Africa and one's in Latin America. Is that right, Nancy? I can't remember where they are. Anyway, Nancy's going to take over for the rest of our talk. Okay, but you're going to, there we go. So uh, one other thing that I just wanted to mention as it relates to schools uh, that 
that um, 350 is doing. We have a what's called a rural advocacy group. We're trying to figure out how to um, support rural climate action, both in agriculture, ranching, food production, and also renewable energy. You may, you may be aware that on the one hand, um, the there's major impacts of climate change on agriculture and food production. But on the other hand, industrial food production um, causes major climate impacts. So that's a tricky question, but I put this slide here just to, to show uh, if you're working with children, how some of these things can relate uh, in terms of creating connections to school gardens, which uh, personally, one of my favorite things uh, in the center there. And on the left, just uh, citizen science. This is a person tagging a monarch butterfly. Uh, kids can learn how to do this too. And also just uh, uh, growing food under agrivoltaics, under solar panels. I think this is an up and coming thing in, in New Mexico. So just wanted to connect the general work we're doing with um, things that teachers can do or anybody working with young children. Uh, you're, you're not gonna tell your kindergartners uh, the bad news about climate change, but you can definitely get them digging in the garden. And it's a really good thing to do just to appreciate, you know. All right, next one, Steph. Oh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. So um, I first wanted to just talk really quickly about um, the, the education group that we have, which is uh, just a collection of teachers either working or retired um, who together and just looked around and didn't see as much climate education K through 12 as we thought should happen. But the first thing we really need to talk about is why this education is really important. Um, it's good to know because we've had situations at the APS school board where uh, people basically practically assaulted the school board members because students were being asked to wear masks. So whatever we do in the schools right now, we have to be able to um, justify it and explain why we're doing that. So the first number one reason that kids need to learn about climate change is because it, these fires, floods, storms, and heat are happening to them right now. This is uh, actually a photograph of a school uh, from the California town of Paradise. Uh, and the students at this school, I happen to know because I met some people from there, are learning in a, in a deserted big box store right now. They have experienced, I mean, just look at this playground, it really, um, so if, if you're experiencing something, you have the right to know about what is going on in your world. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, <laughs> uh, oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, climate injustice is already affecting students of color unequally and the most. Um, most of you are aware of the fact that most of the people who are most impacted by climate change are the people who have contributed the least to its creation in the first place. Um, the entire global South, basically. Uh, and a good, not only that, but in the United States as well, uh, from the um, uh, wells at Chaco Canyon to the chemical plants in Louisiana to, I lived in Chicago for many years. There was a giant pet coat plant right on the river in the um, most intense Mexican-American neighborhood. So um, if it's affecting you more now and here even in the South Valley here in Albuquerque, um, that you need to be able to create your own defense. And as you can see, these are students who have just done that from all over the country. There's amazing, wonderful work going on right now everywhere. So the third reason um, has to do with uh, powerful groups providing climate misinformation. Um, Katie Worth just came out with this book. She's an investigative reporter and you don't need to read this book to learn about this, but it is really interesting. The 
um, insertion of the oil and gas industry into and fossil fuels in general into US education has a fascinating and freaky history going back to the 40s. Basically, oil was peace, justice in the American way. And um, this is still happening today. There are still uh, curricula being presented in schools by oil companies sowing doubt about climate change and the rest of it. So there's, she's on, done a lot of podcasts and book tours and stuff. And it's a really interesting li listen if you're interested in that history. But um, children uh, deserve actual scientific information, not misinformation. The fourth point is uh, you can tell by the slide that this is something <laughs> that I'm is really near and dear to my heart. And so I put too much information on the slide, but basically uh, climate anxiety among youth is real and needs to be addressed. We all need a safe place to mourn as well as to organize. I think when this movement started, it was just a bunch of nerdy scientists. Uh, not that I don't love those nerdy scientists, they were essential to this process, but uh, with slides and graphs and charts, but as more and more people have become involved, it's really obvious that um, this is not just a time for action, but it also requires self-care and um, mourning and tears. It's a, I don't care how hard you work and how many victories you have, this work and the knowledge about this will take, take a toll. It'll take a toll on the students that you're teaching and it will take a toll on you. Um, so I've put a couple of books in the upper right-hand corner there that you might want to check out in this regard. Uh, All We Can Save, it's a feminist perspective, a bunch of essays. And uh, Britway's new book, which isn't even out yet, I haven't read it, but she has a website called Generation Dread. And on the, this very important study that was recently done, I know you can't read the small print, but it's basically they did a, a 10 country uh, survey of 10,000 students from the ages of, I don't know, 14 to 25. And things like people have failed to care for the planet. The future is frightening. Family security is threatened. People thinking humanity is doomed. Most valued things will be destroyed. This is the way to too many people, uh, especially youth, are looking at the future. But on the left, I really want to bring um, out just as you're teaching, as you're doing your own work, as you're talking to your neighbors, um, your mind and body and spirit, just like those around you, has basic needs in this climate crisis, need for a sense of safety, to be soothed, calmed, and anchored, to feel motivated, capable, participatory, and productive need for connection and togetherness and keep learning about your mind, growing beneficial resources and seeing how this can inform your engagement with climate change. I've learned a lot in the last six years from uh, Pueblos and uh, my Diné uh, compatriots on just on the importance of this self-care. And I just can't stress this enough. Um, this is really important. And every teacher, we're used to teaching a lesson and moving on, but this is something that requires an emotional connection as well. And the final reason that we need to be teaching um, to uh, young people is that they can really, they can make a powerful difference. Uh, and I, I just have been thinking just in the time that I've been really actively engaged in this work, we went from basically a one single Swedish student with a little sign that said uh, school strike for climate in front of the Swedish parliament to last year at uh, COP26 outdoors, uh, literally tens of thousands of um, youth from all different countries and all different backgrounds all over the world um, chanting this global justice slogan, global warming is a war of the rich against the poor. So the consciousness of young people about this problem and their ownership of it and their leadership of it is essential, really essential to the to a, a healthy planet and healthy people on it. So this really is important work. 
Okay, so next thing I want to just talk really quickly about um, is 350 Education Group. Again, we're a bunch of volunteers, educators. The first thing we did when we sat down to talk was, well, let's take a look and see what materials are already available. And we were really surprised to learn that there are a lot of materials available. So if you go to 350NewMexico.org, it's in the chat and it's easy to find, and uh, go over to that uh, that top line to where it says teaching climate change, we have um, developed, uh, we've located a bunch of uh, resources from videos and art projects to curricula to um, uh, examples of youth doing work and organizations that are youth led that are doing work. A lot of resources on that page and there's always new ones. So we'd like to invite, especially those of you who are teaching or working with youth, if you have other ideas and things, send them to us because we really do uh, wanna keep these resources growing. Um, so we looked at what was available and then we said, well, we did the research and then we said, well, what should we do now? And the answer to that question was this next slide, which is we decided to develop in some fit of craziness, really, a New Mexico-based middle school climate change education unit of four classes, and we've titled it Climate Hope from Knowledge to Action. It's a four-day middle school unit. And um, here's just some, some bullet point facts about it. It's We're testing it uh, next month um, in a, a trial. And this program is intended not for the teachers who uh, this is their passion. They love teaching this. It's the core of the work that they do. Uh, but teachers who are not quite cl climate confident, I would say, um, as I said, we didn't, when I was in graduate school, we did not learn how to teach about climate change. Uh, and there are many, many teachers who are in this situation. They're nervous about it. They feel uncomfortable about it. And our idea is we come in, we uh, assist, they're there in the class, they do this, and then they'll be able to carry on in the future and get something going in, in their school. So that's our, that's our idea, we'll see. Um, it also, I just wanna mention, this is really important that it includes science, but it also includes language arts, social studies. Um, it should include art and music, and this really is a cross-disciplinary issue and, um, has elements of, of mathematics. I have a ton who teaches mathematics and I've been sending him problems on these things. Really, no matter what you're teaching, there are ways to bring in the issue of climate change. And, and so it also includes an action component, in this case, a letter writing exercise that we're starting out with. But I actually think it should be against the law to teach about climate change and not engage students in taking some action. It is absolutely, it's empowering and it's necessary, period, for all those reasons that I went through before. And um, also we're, we're unabashedly stating that our goal is to build some ongoing school awareness and activity from um, just getting kids to think about, well, how does our school get heated? How does our school get cool? What kind of energy? do we use to uh, creating a climate club at the school and uh, hooking up with other schools possibly eventually as well. And also finally, just what I referred to before, it's intended to help build a safe space for climate emotion and action. So that's really important. And then I'm just gonna run over very quickly. This is still in the testing stage, but just to give you some idea of what we're thinking of. And once we test it, <laughs> I'm sure it will change. But uh, day one uh, really uh, focuses on the greenhouse effect, uh, as you can see on the chart on the left. And this is the little experiment, um, Steffi, that they <laughs> that we have where they um, uh, just set up an experiment to sort of reflect a uh, the blanket greenhouse effect. So we've got a little science in here, pretty basic, but it works. And day two uh, focuses on the effects of climate change in New Mexico, um, the need for quick action on this. It's not just enough to go, well, yeah, okay, that's good. The, those are bad things and they're in the future. 
but the urgency of the window that we have now to make an effect. Um, and then finally, uh, just playing a little game with mitigation and adaptation. This may sound a little bit nerdy, but we wanna give middle school students some um, good vocabulary and to really grasp the idea that we need to be both mitigating, that is reducing um, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions and all the things that go with it, while at the same time we're adapting our waterways and our insulating our homes and things like that. So that's the second day. And then day three goes to um, just examples and issues of climate justice of which there are many, uh, again, referring back to that idea that uh, the people who are the most impacted have done the least and made the least contributions to the problem. And um, it's some very powerful resources that we found to sort of convey that idea. And then just to get um, students uh, to thinking in not every category of what can be done, but uh, beyond um, recycling plastic bags, which that's a whole nother thing, uh, to really get into sub substantive issues such as stopping fossil fuel production while building clean energy, creating carbon-free schools, getting them to look at their school, their area, transportation, how do they get to school, how do they get back, how that could be changed, um, and also just building youth leadership. So we have certain ideas that we're gonna be steering them into. And then finally, day four um, is letter writing. Now this doesn't you know, okay, so you're gonna spend a whole day writing a letter, but actually composing a letter is, uh, is it requires figuring out how you describe the problem, how you describe a solution, who might address that solution, uh, whether it's the principal or the governor or the mayor or whomever, um, and then actually writing that letter, talking with your friends about this, coming up with something, and then actually sending it and see what happens. So uh, it it's it may not sound like much, but uh, we really feel like that element that uh, having a say, putting your words um, in, putting your thoughts into words and your words into action is a really important element. So um, then I guess I just wanted to sort of summarize at the, at the very end that we are, we are just volunteers, we're just people um, trying to build a broad-based international movement that will make a more just and livable world. And so, um, we need a really big tent to do this all over the world and uh, from all different sections of society, all different people. And so we just are seeking always collaborators, partnerships, um, sharing of information. Uh, it's a big job. And the most rewarding part of it is just connecting with other people and building a movement. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nancy and Steffi, for sharing with us and highlighting the importance of implementing these topics into the classroom and some ideas of how students can get involved. And I, I liked your emphasis on the emotional toll that this work um, has on us and the importance of kind of realizing that and recognizing that. Um, I had never really considered that before, Nancy. So thank you so much, both of you, um, for sharing your time with us and your insights and all of the work that you do. Um, I would like to open it up now. Um, again, if you can turn your camera on, we'd love to see your face. If not, that's okay. Um, but open it up now for questions for Nancy and Steffi, and then we're going to do our own um, breakout rooms and have discussion where you get to work with partners to kind of um, flesh out these topics a little bit more. So does anyone have any questions for Nancy or Steffi? Feel free um, to just chime in. Rachel? Yeah, I um, I wanted to know how one would go about bringing y'all into like a, a into the classroom. Like, I teach middle school, I teach social studies and English language development. And I'm thinking, oh, I was gonna do a persuasive writing unit. We are gonna write letters to our local lawmakers. That was my plan for the end of the year, my English class. So I don't know if you have space for another, another four day session at Garfield, but I would love to have y'all. It seems like you're doing amazing work. 
um, email us <laughs> and we'll talk. I'm not sure our clock is running out on this year, but this is not a one-year project. We're trying to get this going and then we wanna take it to as many schools, especially middle schools as possible. So I hear you, that is music to my ears. Uh, uh, let's put, uh, let me put my email in the chat too. So you can just email us. Perfect, thank you so much. Thanks, Rachel. Any more questions? Here's mine. Steph, did you put yours? I'll do mine. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, we are um, going to move on. Um, Nancy and Steffi, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the workshop, but if you have to go, that is fine too. Thanks so much again for joining. We really appreciate having both of you here with us today. All right. Best to everyone. Um, okay, so we want to follow up um, Nancy and Steffi's presentation with some discussion questions on how we might implement climate justice curriculum into the classroom. So we are going to um, break you into groups of two or three and have you address these questions with your partners. Um, Whitney's going to copy and paste the questions into the chat so you can see them when you're in the breakout room. And then um, after about five minutes-ish, we'll pull you back um, to the big group and we'll have a discussion and each group can share kind of like main points that they came up with. So the questions are, do you teach about climate change in the classroom? What are the biggest hurdles to implementing climate change and justice curriculum? And what do you wish you had more curriculum on? So I think for those of you who are not educators, but are students, we can think about our own experience as students um, in middle school or high school or elementary school or even um, our undergraduate experience and what would we want more of and did we learn anything um, about climate change um, in our um, educational journeys. So we will see you all in about five minutes. Okay, cool. Thanks so much for your presentation. Oh, you're welcome. This, this was, we, we did a survey, so we're kind of curious to, that had these same questions. So we're sort of very curious to hear about what people say to these questions. Yeah, we'll see. I think this group is um, really interesting. Usually we don't get very many people who are not educators, very few. So I think, um, I don't know if our advertising, I mean, it's great. I love having all of the different kind of inputs and ideas. Um, so the, hopefully the discussion will be fruitful. It sounds like the sustainability program had an assignment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you guys were here for that part of it, because I don't think that we're going to produce what, what they're looking for in our, um, our lesson plans. Yeah, I don't know that there was a, a piece in the introduction about film. Is that what you guys are going to work on? I feel like 
I'm not sure that we were what was expected. <laughs> no, you guys were great. This is exactly what we wanted. We are doing our unit really focused on documentary filmmaking in regards to like climate justice and indigenous indigenous resiliencies to climate change. And so we wanted to connect like these global issues on a more local scale, because I think a lot of times that can be missing that you don't need to look very far to see these climate change issues occurring. So that your presentation was great. I think we would have gotten, I think we, I think they might have become bored if we just talked only about curriculum the whole time. <laughs> Unless maybe they're educators. I don't know. Maybe that's something that is exciting, but. Well, if uh, Rachel uh, uh, reaches out to us and we uh, get to go to Garfield, I will feel 100% thrilled to have been here and done this. So uh, I'm really grateful to just, you know, meet her and hook up with her. So Nancy, that's a STEM magnet school. Yeah. Huh. Awesome. Awesome. So, yeah. Um, it Nancy would be great to. We're part of a project called the Land Witness Project, which was a film, documentary film, uh, going around New Mexico, interviewing rural residents who are in different uh, situations that were being affected by climate change, but the project has kind of had an unfortunate end. But there is one clip do we have Beata's clip up there, Nancy? The what? Do we have Beata's clip up there? Yeah, that's, um, yeah I think so. Uh, so it's the Land Witness Project. You can also, uh, we did a talk at the Honors uh, uh, College about that program. And Beata Totsi Pena um, from, uh, gave a talk. A of a brilliant talk to a number of uh, students who are really interested in that. And she's one of the people that's featured in this land witness project, which we're still having the can. And then anyway, one thing or another, <laughs> the pandemic happened. Um, but so that's another example of filmmaking. Um, yeah, that would be great if we could add, uh, um, add that to our resource list because we have a bunch um, of resources, resource guides um, that have to do with climate justice and documentary filmmaking. So that would be cool to add. Yeah, and then the video also, isn't up. Oh, it's not up. She, but the story about it. It's on YouTube though. It, if you look- Oh, at, okay. If you look on the Land Witness Project on YouTube, you can find all three of the videos that, one was um, a farmer from the South Valley who does a lot of work with youth actually. And um, the second was the land manager at the time for the Bosque del Apache uh, Wildlife, National Wildlife Refuge. And then the third one that we produced is Beata. So if you look under YouTube, you can okay. see them. They're really short. Um, awesome. They're beautiful and they're well done. And maybe you can, you know, link to that in some way. Yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. we'll add those to the list. I'm going to close these breakout rooms and have everyone come back. All right. And I'm probably going to do Mexico that. homeowners, if you're tired of paying too much money for electricity, and have a history. <laughs> oh, that commercial. <laughs> I can picture that guy standing next to that electric meter. <laughs> That's how many times I've heard that. <laughs> <It's> pathetic. <laughs> we'll have to do, um, see if we can't, I think that you emailed Whitney your slides that you guys presented. And then if you feel comfortable with us adding that to our larger slideshow, but we, we can talk about that later. Just a nugget to Nancy, think about. Do you mean the, the um, presentation to the Honors College? Is that what you mean on YouTube? Um, no, I, the videos are on YouTube under Land Witness, no? Maybe not. Okay, I'll keep looking because okay. she has a lot of videos on YouTube. All right. Uh, okay. okay, welcome back everyone. Um, maybe, uh, okay, let's, 
think that the questions are in the chat. So let's maybe Whitney, you could stop sharing your screen and we can just um, make everyone a little bit bigger for our conversation. And then we'll go back to the, uh, the slideshow presentation. So does anyone want to share what well, we can start with the first question? Do you teach about climate justice in the classroom? Um, I've been coming here a long time. Share? Well, in our group, can you hear me? Am I interrupting anyone? Um, the, uh, it was interesting. The student was saying that climate change uh, and the science, the politics, everything about it comes up in conversations between peers and also practically in every class, even though the class may not be directly related. Um, and I thought that was an interesting point that Ian made. Uh, and I was wondering if that was the experience of the other young folks <laughs> on the, uh, this particular um, panel or conversation. Any other students want to add their experience? I think for me, um personally i've we've talked about some climate climate issues in talking about um kind of uh, global inequalities um like nancy and steffi both highlighted um and how the people who are responsible for the climate crisis are not the ones the most affected i don't take science classes and i haven't for a long time so um that's kind of the extent of what I've learned. And in high school, for me, which was a while ago, we didn't really cover it at all, even in our science classes. Um, okay, let's move on to the second question. What are the biggest hurdles to implementing climate change and climate justice in your curriculum? Well, if I could talk again, uh, I'll urge <laughs> other people to talk, maybe. Um, uh, uh, both Ian and I brought up that probably the biggest hurdle, uh, particularly perhaps in rural areas, um, um, is the politics surrounding climate change. And that the introduction of any curriculum into a system where there are people who feel that the, quote, climate change is a hoax, you know, could be a politic, quite politically difficult. Um, uh, and uh, we weren't quite sure how one goes around, uh, goes about addressing that. You know, obviously you try to present it in the most apolitical way you can, but, you know, it's like, well, does it exist or not is a, is a political question right now in our country. Yeah. Do you have anything to um, to say in response to that, Nancy or, or Steffi, of how to deal with kind of the political influence or how politically these things can get in, involved? Nancy, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> What's the name <laughs> of the wonderful climate scientist in Texas? Oh, um... <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. Well, anyway, she's, if you watch her YouTubes, she talks about how to talk to people, particularly because she's an evangelical Christian and she's a, um, a quilter and, and she lives in Texas <laughs> of all places. So she, uh, gosh, I'm trying to, I can't believe I'm, I'm blanking on her. I'll put her name in the chat when she comes back, but she has great, great YouTubes on how to talk to people. Um, and uh, 
there there are other there are other places on how you know how to breach that. Um, I know you know people also say that um, you know particularly if you're in a science class that this isn't a matter of beliefs. This is this is what the science says, and that you know even if you're going to argue about it, you should know at least what the science what the scientists say. Um, even if you you know don't believe it, you should at least learn it well enough so you, you know what we're arguing against. And I think that's what teachers sometimes say. But um, uh, Nancy, yeah, this is Catherine Hanho. Um, she has a yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> she has a series on PBS that um, just says a very simple Q and A kind of thing where it's cartoon based. Um, uh, I think that that uh, and you know it's I, I part of the problem is I mean I there are some really moving accounts I've heard of uh, teachers who te living in Oklahoma and stuff who are just very carefully threading the line but it, it's just not true that most climate scientists you know have any doubt about this at all so if you stick to the facts and stick to the uh, the urgency of the situation. I think that that was the advice that I've heard other teachers give who are in those challenging situations. But that's one of the reasons that I wanted to talk about all the reasons why this is important because there will be challenges. There are people who just give knee jerk reactions to all of these things. Also, just in the rural work that we've, we've been doing, um, Sometimes they don't call it climate change, but they do sure do talk about how it's getting a lot hotter than it used to be, and the storms are a lot different, and the water, you know, the effects, whether you what you name it, um, but the effects are seen by many many people uh, these days. And Texas, one of the most reactionary states in terms of all this stuff, has more wind power than any other state. So. You know, sometimes it's a matter of talking about the economics. You know, if you're a rancher and you can get that five thousand dollar a month check from the wind turbine company every month, uh, you really don't need to debate all that stuff. Just give me the money. You know, so there's many different approaches. Thanks, Nancy and Steffi, and for um, your contribution, Margaret. Um, for the sake of time, because we still have a couple lesson plans to go over, I think we're going to move on unless anyone has something they want to contribute further on what they discussed with their partners. Excellent. Okay. No, yeah. Nancy, much. can you just Rachel. say that last, the, <laughs> the name? Uh, Catherine Hayhoe. Hey, hey ho, as in like, um, yeah, can you spell it? Um, hmm, hold on one second. Let me Sorry, no, 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 it's okay. H A uh, Y H O E, I think she's Canadian. Um, I don't know if somebody has, Here, I'll, I'll give you a link to her TED talk. Yeah, that'd be awesome. She does, and she has these great PBS cartoons. I think it's H, those are. Those are those are smaller subject matter ones, but yeah. here's a TED talk on you know how to talk about climate change. Thank to you. Someone who doesn't believe in climate change. Yeah, H A Y H O E. Hey, oh, yeah. yeah, she's terrific. Okay, great. Thanks again, Steffi and Nancy and everyone. Um, so now Whitney's going to tell us a little bit about La Vocera and then talk about um, our lesson plan on how to make a documentary. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, also, I wanted to add Catherine Hayho has an episode on the podcast, How to Save the Planet, um, and it's titled The Evangelical Christians Taking on Climate Change. It's a really interesting episode. Um, so that's an, more information on her. Okay. So. In the interest of time, we will not be able to fully go into the film guide that we created for the Laboseta documentary, but it will be sent out in the email with the curriculum and the resource packet at the end of this presentation. Um, the film guide includes like a pre-activity worksheet, understanding documentary filmmaking terms, then there's a couple of um, 
mapping worksheets to do that looks at sort of different perspectives on who owns what land or who um, like different indigenous nations within Mexico and then the United States. Um, and then there'll be discussion questions on the film guide itself. But first I wanted to give some context for what this documentary is. I don't know if people have heard about this before or watched it themselves. It's available on Netflix. I highly recommend it. Um, so the documentary directed by Luciana Kaplan came out in 2019 and it documents for the first time in the history of Mexico, how indigenous people organized to have a candidate running for president in 2018. Um, it's an intimate approach to the life of Maria de Jesus Patricio Marichui, who is featured here in this photo um, and was elected by the indigenous government council to represent them in this process. The documentary portrays the challenges that she and the indigenous government council face in order to get the necessary signatures to be on the ballot. Um, the documentary occurs in the context of a country plagued by violence and racism towards women and indigenous groups alike. So we're going to play a little trailer so you have a bit more context on the documentary itself. Um, I'm going to play it. I think you're frozen, Whitney. Hello. Can't wait just a second to see if she comes back from frozen land. Oh. Okay, she disappeared. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm going to share my screen um, until she comes back and finish the slideshow if I can. Let's see here. Sorry guys technical difficulties. <clears throat> okay. Let me share my screen. Okay. Yeah, see my okay. Can you see what I'm sharing? Oh, are you back? Me, could you keep sharing your screen, Jasmine? My Wi-Fi isn't great, so I I think it was too much was going on, so it kicked me off. Yeah, let me okay. see. I can't figure out play um or play a slide team but i'll just get, like um i will have to use playing documentary so we there's documentary there's a, a trailer for it um unfortunately we're having technical difficulties on playing it. But let me um, take us deeper into La Bocera and then the um, main documentary less. Jasmine, I have the, on my screen, I have the trailer starting at that point that you're showing. Do you want me to, is that what you were doing? Oh yeah, can Sure. Yeah. Is this it? I probably have this journey. Yes. 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 Yes.
que la comunidad ahorita ya está solicitando que se restituyan las más de 10.500 hectáreas, ¿verdad? La alimentación, la soberanía alimentaria, pues es una forma de hacer política, es una forma de buscar la autonomía. Sí, bien, su aldama es vigilante de la guardia tradicional. Es el preso político de ahorita del estado de Sonora. Y cuando preguntamos qué pasó, está encarcelado, ya lo mataron. Compañeros, si no hacemos algo que sacuda de nuevo al país, vamos a desaparecer. Lo que no me gusta es la etiqueta, son indígenas. No solamente va a ser para los indígenas, sino que va a ser para México. Han llegado algunos mensajes, por ejemplo este que dice que esa manchita se parece a la que limpia mi casa. Y no nomás a los huevaritas, y al gobierno... No nos respetan los mexicanos. El proceso electoral que se está viviendo para nosotros es un cochinero. Encontramos simulaciones de prensa para votar, muchas otras cosas de las credenciales. Hay un compromiso más por este México que lo tienen secuestrado los de arriba. Se lo vamos a quitar. Ya no solamente estaba ahí callada por donde voy, luego me hablan y dicen es que me animaste. Si la destrucción y muerte es el progreso, pues estamos en contra. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Whitney, are you there? Yeah, I am. I think I'm going to keep my camera off so that hopefully I don't cut out again. Um, but I can try presenting again. Let's. If it's too to... hard to share your screen, you can. We only have about 10 minutes left. We don't want to keep you here all night. Um, so you can just go over some stuff without sharing your screen if that's going to glitch it out. That sounds good. Um, could you actually share your screen? You don't have to go into presentation mode. I just think the visual aid might help. I'll just breeze through it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And then if you'll go to the making a documentary slide, I'll just take like two minutes to go over yeah. that and then we can do. Okay. Um, so one of the lesson plans that we have in this unit is the making a documentary. Um, this is the one lesson plan that could present the, the greatest number of differentiation options and as well as potential challenges. So in order to prepare for this unit, um, we were thinking that it would be good context to allow students to look at the resource guide by, um, it's titled Ivy Gubertamenchu, an Indian woman in Guatemala, which is on the LAII curriculum page. Um, and it's, testimony, uh, literary analysis, and indigenous activism. So then the students themselves will make the documentary, which I'll go into in a little more detail on the next slide, and then the screening of, this, of the documentaries that the students make themselves. So if you go to the next slide, Jasmine. Okay. Um, so, while students are in the process of making their documentaries, um, ideally all information presented should be factual, and but we encourage the students to be as creative as they can within the constraints provided. Um, students will spend their class time making the documentary. It should take no more than two to three class sessions. However, the lesson plan itself is adaptable and it is up to your discretion as the educator. The documentaries themselves should be no more than two to three minutes and are to be created in the form that's most accessible to students. So that can mean a voice recording, a smartphone recording. Um, if technology isn't available, then students can present their work to the class as if it were being recorded via a skit or through a presentation board that they've worked on. And of course, the students are able to use any resources at their disposal, so the internet, books in the classroom, art materials, um, something they've learned from a talk, prior knowledge. Um, the questions on this slide here are the sort of guiding questions for this lesson plan, which 
you can see here what's the issue, who's involved, what local organizations are addressing this, when did this issue take place, so on and so forth. And the students should pick maybe five of these questions. They don't have to answer all of them, but this will help guide them in answering and in the creation of their documentary. Part of the point of this lesson plan is to connect those sort of global issues that we see in the other parts of this curriculum guide that we hand out. We could see like from La Boceda, those are climate change issues affecting different parts of Mexico. And so we wanted to, to really drive home the point that we can see climate change happening here in our own communities and that students themselves can take action. Um, and one of the beginning stages of taking action is usually familiarizing yourself with an issue. So um, that is a brief synopsis. There's more details in the lesson plan itself and differentiation options as well um, that will be sent out in the packet at the end. And then I think Jasmine, we could probably skip this next slide and just go to the final. Yeah, so I don't even know have time for the just in the closed discussion. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Um, so now we just want to open it up for any questions or comments that you might have before we wrap it up. Does anyone have anything? Okay, um, so again, we kind of had to speed through the um, last part, so we apologize for that, but the um, lesson plans for La Vocera and the how to make a documentary um, will all be part of the kind of comprehensive resource packet for this workshop. Um, and then there's a lot of resources on the resource guide and Steffi and Nancy have given us some more, and then we're going to try and include their slides um, into that packet of information. So we again wanted to thank um, Steffi and Nancy for coming and for your presentation. That was so great. It was a pleasure to have you and also to thank all of you um, for giving us a little bit of your time and contributing to discussion and being part of the workshop. Um, so I am going to, let me see, I'm just going to copy and paste this, this link, which you will get an email of soon, but this is all the resources um all of the lesson plans the la vocera and the making a documentary and then there's a few more things in there um that we didn't have time to present today so again jasmine you just sent it to me oh shoot thank you okay everyone in meeting here we go um okay there's that and then unless there's anything else we will let you all go Okay, thanks everyone. Have a good weekend.